What is up guys? How are you guys doing today? What up, what up? So today we're gonna talk about um, a lot of cool stuff. I wanna hear a little bit about what you guys have been working on. And I also wanna hear a little bit about how you got to where you are now when it comes to the different positions on set. Because a lot of people starting out, they're wondering what they wanna do uh, within film. There's so many different roles. There's pre-production, production, post-production. Post so how do you fit within all of that and how do you choose your own path? Or does that path naturally uh, kind of chooses you? So let's talk a little bit about that today. So first, yeah, I want to start with Val first and I want to hear a little bit about the recent projects she's been working on. Well, from the top of my mind, I'll say that I've been working on many different things personally for my own production company, which is Hazelnut. Um, and also like personal things, like uh, this year I'm gonna uh, produce with Emmanuel a uh, new uh, documentary, which has been a lot of work from the beginning of the year and it's kind of like my baby right now, but we haven't get to record the interview. So I feel like it's still in process so if I think of um, one of the coolest projects I've been is the one I, I was part of in Texas. I actually was art director and gaffer on set. And that's when your question comes to play. And it's like, how did I end up normally being a gaffer and a director, art director? It's like, I think that is like my, the past that me as a photographer I always tend to control like sets and stuff like that and then once I took my lighting class just like brought a whole different world for me and I loved it so I started getting really into lighting I started buying a good equipment and like that's one of the examples that brought me this far because it's like, it's crazy how at the beginning I was like, well, I think I can do this. Now I'm like normally a gaffer or an art director. So uh, the project in Texas was a um, uh, kind of short documentary for a brand called C4. And this time was about a photographer, which was super incredible. And I think the best part of that was like I was in a crew that I just knew the director because I've been working as a editor for him for over two years. And then everyone else was local, super talented, and I don't know, I was just like learning so much, proving myself, and actually just had a really great time out there. I love Austin, so yeah, I think that's one of like my highlights so far of this year. That's awesome. I, I do want to say, uh, you guys are going to notice I just switched around the lights as Val was talking about lighting. It's getting really yeah. sunny here and it's getting stronger and I already have a key light over here. So I noticed that the sun was coming in stronger. So I just switched it around and I think the shot looks much better right now. Uh, we're going to have an episode talking just about lighting. We're going to explain everything. So we're going to have Val lead that one, but each one of us has a lot of experience when it comes to that because uh, we've all worked as cinematographers, as gaffers before in different projects. Um, but yeah, that was just funny because she was talking about that and I was changing the lights around and I, yeah, I just <laughs> thought, about, thought about that. Um, that's awesome. So just to like go back to that a little bit, C4, so that's the pre-workout brand, right? That's like, that's huge, right? How is it working yeah. with a huge brand compared to working with, with a smaller brand for you, Val, but also, um, I, from my personal experience, the smaller projects teach you a lot that you can bring to set on those bigger ones. Like, it's different, sure, but it's not like, the, the big ones don't get scary anymore. I walk in with exactly. confidence. It, it's a Tabasco commercial, it's a, it's a C4 commercial, it's an eBay project, 
It's a Sodexo, YMCA, big names, and I just walk in and I'm confident because I know what I want to do because I've done the pre-production work. So how, how does the smaller projects carry into the bigger ones for you, Val? With that, with Absolutely. that one in mind, right? With that one that you just... Yeah. Well, I feel like uh, the more you do, the more confident you feel. So since I've been working over a year doing kind of the same thing, maybe playing some roles different than the others, but normally I'm, I'm like just super detailed about like that part. And, you know, like I felt confident because like I could problem solve. And that's a big part of like what I, what I normally do on set. So uh, I was um, on that commercial, I was also a photographer. Oh, I almost forgot. So I was doing still photography for that. And there was a gaffer. So when he, I was like just hanging around and the set, not ready, like I already set up like the desk and stuff where the pictures will take place. I was like, well, let me help around. And, you know, I could just get gaffer work done, you know, like I got a ladder, I topped some holes, there was like a lot of light coming through and I was just having fun, you know, like getting to know the people and I feel like I've done that ever since Blue Room <laughs> or the ones around that time. I'm like, yeah, like I can help around and I, I love to fix light at the end of the day. So yeah, so like the smaller gigs, just like Blue Room or even just small clients just kind of give you the same action when it comes to like just get things done on set so you don't feel anymore like a stranger it's it's weird yeah. when you don't know really what to do and they're just standing there and waiting for somebody to tell you something but if you're putting your hands on it you just feel like it's natural it's something that you've done for a while now so 100 percent. i agree with what you said and i recently went through an experience that was similar to that um uh, emmanuel i promise we're gonna hear from you next i just have to go through this <laughs> through this part because you just reminded me of something um i i did a shoot recently so i usually direct and i usually direct scene or direct talent uh and the recent shoot i did i was the cinematographer for that really the director of photography for that and it was for two brands here one's called Oscling and the other one's called Dunkey and they're huge clothing brands here in Brazil and the fun thing about it is that I knew I wanted to place a light outside to have that light coming in creating that moonlight I knew I wanted to bounce something uh, off the wall to bring back that softer light that I wanted that white light I wanted something in the back that was more yellow to create that room, uh, cozy house interior. I knew that, and I knew that from the films we worked on together. I knew that from smaller projects. And I was implementing that on two of the biggest clothing brands there are in my country, and honestly, in all of Latin America. So, like, you bring that. You just bring that. You learn that. In class, you learn that in small projects, you learn that for small clients or films, and then you bring that to huge clients, to huge sets. And through knowing that, through being, uh, ex to have it, having experienced so much, you're able to bring that naturally. You don't have to come up with this theory or this, you just fix things and you get them done really quick. And, and I think that was really nice. So everyone on set was like, what is he doing? What is he doing? And I was like, outside. You know, like you said, on a ladder, kind of doing this light coming in. Everyone's was like, well, what's that? Why is that light blue? And I'm like, all right, hold on. <laughs> and then when you're done, it's there. It's like a painting. But the thing is, you Love have that part. Like the part of being favorite. active and just like moving around. Just like if yeah. you have to go upstairs, you go, you know, like. You get, you get that experience you learned, but then you implement that into the client's brand, which is important. So each client has a different style. Emmanuel, do you want to talk a little bit about what you've been working on? And if you can um, touch on those subjects, uh, a little bit, of course, of lighting, but also I think of like how each client is different and how you bring that experience to the bigger ones. But maybe you've learned that on a smaller project. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is kind of learning from the smaller projects, learning from the small clients, learning from even the free clients, uh, starting off, let's say, out of college or starting off out of 
a hobby, doing projects and then learning all those mistakes when you're not getting paid and then getting better at those uh, techniques as you grow older and as you get bigger clients. Uh, right now, mostly uh, I'm a DP. I usually get called up for shoots. Uh, I help do the pre-production. I go on set. I manage. I, I do all the shots. Uh, and depending on my role, a lot of times I'm, I'm a producer now and I kind of help things run. Um, you start realizing all those little things that people are doing and then you can kind of show them since you're in a higher position and then you've gone through those things. Uh, after, after college, I kind of went out of my comfort zone and I tried doing a lot of, uh, a lot of short films. Uh, I couldn't get on a position as a DP because no one knew me and I didn't have a camera. So I just went around and I was a PA for, for like six months, seven months. Uh, at various different jobs. Um, ended up pushing up to being a, a, a gaffer at a couple. And then I, I, I worked on being a gaffer for, I think, a year and a half uh, on all the, meh, I would say like a year on a bunch of these uh, free, free shoots. Uh, and that, that makes you learn. That makes you learn how to be a better DP once you know how to do better lighting. You don't shoot for a big brand every day. So where do you get the experience where you actually hang out? Um, well, yeah, you definitely don't shoot for a big brand every day, especially the first couple of years. Uh, it finally gets to a point where you get those constant clients, you get that recognition. Uh, the first couple of years, you get recognition from the footage you get, what you capture, and what you can show off in your reel. The, the more you're into it, the more you're in the career, you get recommendations instead. You get people that know and trust you because they know somebody that knows and trusts you. So um, uh, recently, bigger roles have just been kind of going in there and then kind of showing your full on experience as whatever position you are and then helping the people below you with those experiences. Exactly. So I think that uh, going from not only smaller projects, but projects where you have more creative freedom, then you're able to bring that experience and that freedom to the set on those bigger ones. So for instance, um, even if I'm doing a simple setup like this, it keeps the engines flowing. It keeps the things going. So I'm setting up a camera. I have a little light here. I have another one there. I'm doing a three-point lighting. One of the lights that I'm using is natural because it's coming in from the sun. So there is a whole setup going on. There's sound. Something is happening here where, where my creative engines, they're rolling, they're working. And that way I keep, I keep them oiled for my next big project. So, so it's always having something going. And Emmanuel, you're always doing stuff and I see that. Uh, and that's, that's awesome. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons why when, you're, when you get called for a bigger gig, you go in with that same level of confidence. And that takes time. I don't think there's another way to do it other than it takes time. And for me personally, and I, and I, I do want to recommend that to everybody or at least um, tell you that and then you take it as however you want. Uh, we are not big followers of rules here, but we give more of like a different advice to different people because each person is different. But for me personally, when I took an actual cinematography class and those are not easy to find, uh, so I... We, I met them in Orlando and I lived in Orlando for seven years and, and being in Sao Paulo, I actually found the class that I wanted because it's a bigger city. It's more like New York when it comes to filmmaking. And I took that class in cinematography and, and I learned the, the, the techniques and, and theory behind lighting. And I think that gave me another level of confidence to bring to set. So yes, experience, yes, doing the smaller gigs, yeah, I was doing short films, but also the theory is important and learning with the right professors is very important. So mm -hmm. that's just a really big thing. I would also say too, it's like learning things that aren't necessarily in your level, like in your area of expertise. Uh, as a camera guy, I know how important being a director is and I, I know how important being able to relate to the actor and telling them how to act and how to emote and how to feel. Uh, I know the importance of grip. I know the importance of safety. Uh, I know the importance of you know, even a crafty, just being on set and making sure people are fed. Uh, understanding these different roles and the different levels that they can you know, help the set and help things progress can really help you understand like you need these specific things per the shoot. 
Uh, I don't like going to sets without a gaffer. I don't want to be a gaffer uh, if I'm a DP. Like, it's just too much. It's, it's a lot to handle and it's a lot of things that you have to think about. And understanding that and respecting that and having a professional with you to help you out and help your vision come to life is I feel like something you learn and you see as you go through all these shoots and all these sets and, and you progress to your career. Yeah, you just feel like you're like all the powers get together and get all the stuff done because there's no way you can do or care for, you know, acting and camera and lights and art direction. You know, like you you miss something. So it's a very big learning experience. Um, but out of that comes a lot of you know fun fun times. What are your favorite things uh, to do on set, Fernando? Uh, for me personally, I've always liked the more um, kind of like a, a bigger approach on things. So looking at the bigger perspective and, and looking at things from the outside and kind of understanding that there are uh, different roles to be played, but there are also um, different parts of the process that have to be broken down, have to be executed properly. So I think that's what really gets my attention when it comes to directing, because the director is that position where you see everything from pre-production, through production, through post-production. Yes, it drives you nuts, especially on smaller projects where you have to write the script, you have to direct talent, you have to know what's going on with that shot list, you have to know where the lights are. Sometimes, not the case anymore because we have a great gaffer that I try to put on every single project I can and a great DP, but a lot of times other people select those for you. And when that happens, and it's happened to me multiple times, um, you have to kind of go with the flow and, and, and kind of roll with what you have. And that's scary because sometimes you don't have the right team with you. And when that happens for a director, frustrating uh, because you have already planned everything in the pre-production you already have that production going and then you realize okay hold on I know the story I'm trying to tell this is not it that's not the story I'm trying to tell and, and so answering mm -hmm. your question my love for it is the understanding of the story and making it come to life that's my love for this and you know without a cinematographer there's no way to do it of course that's who's actually capturing that footage um, and, and without any, any position on set, really, regardless of how big or small the set is, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible to do that. And then the editing. The director has to be working closely with the editor to, to figure out if that story that you thought about in the beginning mm -hmm. is still the story you're trying to tell now, months later, sometimes years later, when it comes to a feature film. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's a work effort, uh, but it's a team effort. And also, as personally, I feel like the thing you you do best is the thing that you spend more time in. And whether it's a DP or directing, that probably would be the thing you've been spending the most time at it. And that is just convenient for at least three of us, because like, when we get to produce together, we just boom, do our thing, you know? But then when it comes to you being a freelancer or just like finding yourself in a set, you don't know anybody, you kind of need to get back to your roots where you like to problem solve and then you probably will be doing the best work ever, you know? Yeah, no, it's kind of true. And it's kind of like what, kind of like what Fernando said last time, uh, having that team with you, having someone that can understand your vision and can kind of help you put that together. Uh, as a DP, my favorite thing is like getting the actual vision, getting the, the, the visual perfect to what you're trying to do in your story. Uh, everything's a language. When you're talking, there's different languages. When you're playing music, that's a language of, of sound. Uh, uh, and when you're doing a, a feature, when you're doing a commercial, like that visual aspect is another type of language that you're trying to convey with, this, with the type of story you're trying to do. Uh, so having a good team that can amplify what you're doing, make what you're doing better. For example, I'm the DP. I need a great uh, gaffer like Val to up my DP skills with her amazing lighting. Uh, uh, Fernando, every time I direct with him, 
if, when he, if he's directing somebody and he's really telling them what to do and really kind of letting them go into that role, then the footage comes out with a great scene and a great person talking behind the camera. And another thing is like when you, when, when you work for a bigger client, if there's more people involved, you need to be like more specific for the job that you should be doing. And that also is like a switch of like mindset a little bit. But yeah, anyways. So uh, real world examples. Yesterday I was filming this commercial for a gym, but it was like a friend that needed social media short little videos for his local, you know, yoga and and fitness studio and it's like a small space it's a the definition of a small business something he started a couple years ago and he just needed those videos so i go in with my camera go in with a couple of small little lights a microphone and i'm getting this content and and i'm getting all of these different videos and i'm just realizing that also fuels me that also gives me that adrenaline of like, okay, everything depends on you. If you don't capture it, if you don't capture the sound, if you don't get the footage, if you don't do this and you, and, and you already have to do it thinking about the editing that you're gonna do, then it's pointless. There's no reason for them to hire you. And there's something about that. There's an adrenaline that kind of keeps you going. And it's the videographer really. That's like the job of a videographer, the guy that has to do, or a girl that has to do everything in creating that video, right? And so much responsibility, but it's so cool to do that. And then on Friday, I have this huge project I'm directing and it's probably gonna be like 20 people on set. And again, yeah, it depends on me, but then I have, like Val said, different people playing different roles on set. So it's really fun to me how that works with film and how, how there are different stages and things just get more specific, right? Do you guys uh, want to share any last stories when it comes to that? Maybe a big and a small client? Yeah, I mean, I can jump onto a project I did uh, like a day or two ago. Uh, this guy's a social media guy. He's, he does coaching and he's trying to get more people through the door. Uh, so he hired us to go on there and capture all of his footage. Uh, we helped him. We did a lot of pre-production and we kind of went down the scripts. This was a fun time because I'm usually the DP, but I can kind of go in there and kind of direct uh, the type of things he's saying and kind of tweak uh, the wording for the platform you're going to put it on. Um, I think the more you kind of do these, the more you kind of try realizing where is this going to end up? Is this going to end up on a website? Is this going to end up on TV? Is this going to end up on social media? And that kind of helps you tweak your approach and tweak what you're going to do with them. So it was a great fun time sitting down with him and, and shooting something uh, vertical the whole time. Vertical is always a fun, fun time, fun thing to shoot. And then shooting things that are slightly different than what we usually shoot. We don't, we're not shooting things that are cinematic or, or eye-catching. We're shooting things vertical with someone talking and kind of getting those points across. So it was a good exercise of, of things I've done before compared with like minimal cinematography. Yeah, it's, it's different. But you, if you're in the role, I mean, you, there's like this flashback, I feel like, that come from other people you've seen doing uh, the same thing that comes to you. You know, like the way uh, the last interview I was in for C4, like the way Nate kind of did the whole interview kind of bring me to a mindset when I have to be interviewed and I kind of use the same way to I don't know, probably make a conversation and get the right answers out of it. But it, it comes from other people you've worked with or other people you've seen, whether it's, you know, your favorite YouTuber or somebody that is super legit. You know that they have, you want to build your own technique, but you also get inspiration from other people you've seen directing, for example, or, you know, just doing this type of things. Yeah, I love that. I think it's like a class, right? Life is like a class and you're learning. You can learn inside an actual classroom and learn from professors or you can just learn from other people you've worked with. Uh, so you're going to get hopefully the best part of all of them and, and try to, to make that into, you, you know, into you and you growing as a professional because uh, we're all here learning, learning different things every day. It doesn't matter, again, if you have a degree or not and what kind of degree you have or where, where you went to school. Um, no one's going to know everything, so you're still going to learn with 
specific people and specific projects. That's what I think is so helpful of being always active and being working on stuff. And we're all always active, which is great. Sometimes we're working together and stuff. Sometimes we're working individually on different things. And what matters is we're always learning and we're always practicing our craft. And bringing new stuff into our own projects. <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. That's that's also true. So if I'm, especially for me here, it's a whole journey being a whole different country in my, in you know my home country here in Brazil. I will bring so much from this culture and from this way of creating things. And even Val, when she goes to like Texas to shoot this with C4, she's she was bringing us other styles and approaches. And same with Emmanuel. Uh, I don't know how Emmanuel was filming for social media two days ago because he was at a music festival in a different state for you guys that don't know. So I don't know how he was able to do both, but I don't, I, I don't doubt it. I mean, this guy. <laughs> so, you, you, you got to multitask, man. You got to multitask everything you have. Half of his body is out here partying. The other half is like, yeah, <laughs> the, the so, older I get, the, the more of like the life it's like, Everything's multitasking, everything's juggling, everything all at once. That's true. That is true. And we don't even have kids yet and we're not even married. So imagine what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Um, it only gets worse. I know, right? It's time for it to create a prom. Yay! Yay! Let's go for it. So today we'll start with Emmanuel and Ooh. here I am. <laughs> So let's imagine there's like a magical pet shop. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the animal and, you know, their strange or magic part of it? And how what it looks, the, basically. What would be the strange? So can I get it? Do I have to create a whole new animal out of my mind or can I pick something from like pop culture? Ooh, you can pick something from pop culture. Pop culture. Oh, I have so many animals. But I mean, it's a magic, it's like, it's a, the point is like, it's not a dog or a cat or like a rabbit, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a magical creature. A magical creature that can do magical things. Oh my God. I don't want to be this basic, but like, it's a, it's, it's a question that I have so many, like I'm, I'm, I'm sifting through my catalog of animals I've played with in video <laughs> games and in movies. Um, but to kind of <laughs> cut it short, I would say, my my first Pokemon, I would say, like my Squirtle. If I can get my Squirtle, I, I have. Can I grab it? No, I I can't grab it. But I have a Pokeball, a glass Pokeball with a Squirtle inside it, like all drawn drawn in, uh, because that was my first Pokemon in my first Pokemon game. Uh, so that was like my baby. So if I could get a real Squirtle, that would be great. <laughs> I love it. How about you, Squirtle? Woo, let's go, Pokemon. I thought of Pokemon too. It's like one of the reference, like the coolest little things. For me, you just, you kept saying magical, magical. So you got me thinking of Harry Potter and I, it's funny. I saw all the Harry Potter movies. I watched all of them, but I haven't read all the books. And, and, and the only book I read from Harry Potter is the one no one read, <laughs> which, which is the, the magical creatures and where to find them. <laughs> no oh. one did. It's, it's fun because that, book is like it belonged to to the actual characters so so it has like stuff written all over it uh mm -hmm. like from harry potter himself or you know from his friends from hermione and all of that and so it has like their notes on it but anyways the the creature is this invisible monkey or monkey that gets invisible and that's i think it's from him or from his like fur i guess or his hair that you can make the invisible cloth like the that they wear in the the cape that they wear in the film right oh yeah. i didn't know that so i that would be my that would be my animal cool okay i think i mean both things came to my mind like harry potter and pokemon that's crazy guys but i think i will make my 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 own so yeah i think i'll have like a you know like a little fluffy ball the, those like they're like squishy with like a big eyes type of thing and probably their magic will be um i don't know maybe they smell super super delicious 
and you get relaxed from it. <laughs> I think that will be super cool. So that will be my my little animal. Very fluffy, very, very soft, squishy, and no sounds. Like just like a big eyes. That's it. <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> and you need animal? Like, so, so, what, so what that smell what makes you relax? Like what else does it do? Is it just... Yeah, it smells super delicious. Like, I don't know, imagine the best smell ever. And he doesn't poop, right? He doesn't poop. No, no poop, no poop, nothing. That's no bark, no... Yeah. And if you travel, you can put him to sleep in a good way. And it, it works like a him. pillow. You know when you get, you got uh, any... Perfect. We're gonna create I know, right? that one day. Yeah, I think we're gonna... I think like we're gonna get to a point with technology where we're gonna make the perfect pets and we're not gonna have to like get them from the wild anymore. I love you know that. I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you hear what they're doing in California? They're already making, uh, they're, they're 3D printing meat and putting it in restaurants. So we we're go. already halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> we already have protein. <laughs> there we go. Thank you guys for tuning in. That was great. It was a great time uh, for me. What do you guys think mm. about it? Had a good time too? <laughs> it was too? a fun time. It was good. a fun time. The hand, a fun time. The hand be behind me is like rock. So make oh, sure God. you guys subscribe to the channel and yeah, follow us on social media and stay tuned to the next episodes of Unbox Creativity. Mm.